I was always told, go to college, buy a house, get a job, move to the suburbs. Uh, didn't do any of those things. This could be accessible to everyone. This changed how we approach design. People appreciated it when we sold out the eight unit that we did before we even broke ground on it. You could do high design at a price point that was accessible in these townhomes. They weren't seeing that at the time. Not only the options, but just putting in higher quality finishes than any other person was doing, and then added more of an attainable price point. Okay, TVD episode 49, here today with Skyline 41. Welcome to the show, you guys. Oh, happy to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, well, I want you guys to introduce yourselves as a husband-wife duo. Oh, yeah. So, Stephen, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, Steve Ashkenazi, I, both of us moved to, to Tampa in 2018 and started in real estate in 2013. Martine Ashkenazi, I, I'm just here to support Steve's business. But, moral support. Yeah, moral support, spousal support, but... Yeah. I'm and the, design lead. And design lead. But it is definitely like Steve's brainchild, Steve's operation, and, and very much all of his hard work. That's awesome. And were you guys married when you started off in real estate, Steve? We started dating in 2013. Hopefully yep. that's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually started the business pretty much right when, when I met her. Uh, yeah. Just was working in accounting at the time. Got a lead where someone came to me and said, what do you think about investing in real estate? I said, yeah. I know nothing about real estate. He sent me the returns and I didn't think they were good enough for the risk I was taking because mm. he's never done, he never did a project. He's like, this is my first project. Would you like to invest? And I said, not for 10%. <laughs> so we ended up negotiating the profit sharing. And six months later, I received about a 50% return on a very small investment and kind of the light went on. Like, yeah, how do I, do this again. He's just like, find me a deal and we'll do it. So instead of spending uh, the eight to eight, like my company was expecting me to do, working on my day job, I was spending all the time calling realtors, looking on the MLS, trying to find deals that fit this model that he gave me. He, he was educated through like the Fortune Builders program, which is probably not as popular as it used to be, where it was like an educational service where you'd, you go through these seminars and I had, I never had any of that training. So I just so just send me the model, let me know what numbers it needs to be, and we'll try to do it. So someone that has never done a deal trying to ex budget and figure out how much it's going to cost to renovate a bathroom or kitchens and definitely failed miserably trying to do that, <laughs> but certainly, uh, you know, was able to find some opportunities and started feeding that pipeline. And for the first deal we did ended up being a, a good success. And again, it was just kind of a roller coaster from there where the, we jumped into more projects in Chicago and where the kind of had like a minimum hurdle. And then come 2015, 16, this was when the, all those house shows on HGTV were. So many. Yeah. It was kind of over a little too many. Those there was things a lot of people there. getting everyone into it in Chicago. Like anyone was, and everyone yeah. was a flipper. So we started migrating to more new construction mm. and then bigger apartment deals. And then come 2016, we said we need a new market. Wow. That, so that first deal, you were hooked. The I mean, first you got deal that was return. hooked because I, I I had some experience with the hedge fund. I was doing small cap equities, and it's we'd spend eighty hours a week grinding, meeting with management, mm -hmm. trying to underwrite these stocks, thinking these were great investments, and they would never materialize. And that's what was hooked about real estate: is we found the asset, we put the value add, we improved the value of the asset, and sold it for a value. Whereas with stocks, I can't buy Google and mm. make Google go up. Yeah, right. There's way more control in real estate. So it's a force mechanism to increase the value of the asset. And I think that's what got me hooked is you see the increase. You can tangibly see the kitchen go from a 1920s kitchen to a brand new construction kitchen. And that's that in itself is adding value. So from 2012 to about 2016, you you were kind of um, watching him do this or were you involved in some of the design? No, that was like more like I think we would I, I would more I mean, at the time we were just dating. So we were I was just like go to like some of the showings and whatnot. And it was like interesting for me. Um, but I, I mean. You lived your life. I lived my life. And, and we, I mean, we loved our time in Chicago. Yeah. Like we were in our mid-20s in Chicago, and it was the time of our lives. Um, and then wanted to start to look for a new market, and we hated winter. He grew up in South Florida. I grew up in the Caribbean. Like, I did, oh, my, four, cool. did my four years of Chicago winters. I was done. And so we, he started looking for new markets. He had an opportunity uh, to move to Miami. And so once you moved to Miami, you started really, like, looking for new markets. And by finding the new market to invest, like our par partners were in Chicago at the time, like it just like made sense that I started to take on more of the design stuff. And then also at that point, like 
I was four years older and like wanted like a house and things like that. Mm-hmm. So you're like on Pinterest, like oh, doing what right. girls do. Um, and we like, I want this, I want this. Um, and so that's where I started to get like a lot more interested. But that was more like when you started to expand to the second market. And like at that point, I think we were like engaged or whatever. And so was you're, no you're longer originally just a from girlfriend. South Florida. Um, how did you find <laughs> the Tampa market? So started spending some time in looking at South Florida, probably in from an investment standpoint, when, right when I graduated college in 2009, which was the worst time to graduate college, I was always told, go to college, buy a house, yeah. get a job, marry, move to the suburbs. <laughs> uh, didn't do any of those things. Um, so certainly 2009, that market crash made looking at real estate kind of made the negative stigma. Miami got hit worse than most other markets did. Yeah. So didn't really start looking at it until we moved back there the second time. And at that point in time, Miami was booming. Uh, it was things didn't make sense compared to where they were at from a lot of other markets. The amount of international money that was flooding there, all cash buyers. Mm-hmm. You couldn't really compete and actually make a return. Whereas we thought Chicago was skinny in terms of the deals that we were seeing there. Miami was worse than that. Like basically from a buy and hold standpoint, there was deals trading for two, three caps. Wow. Yeah. And it's very the multifamily side, I would be putting the numbers where I was like, you know, you buy it for this, you build it for this, this is what you'd sell it for. They're like, well, well, and next year you're going to sell it for 20% more than the comps are selling for today. And that was always something that I never would be willing to do that, to say, yes, I understand mm. Zillow is expecting this market to go up by 20%, but if it stays flat, that means we're breaking even or losing money on this deal. But people in Miami were taking that chance. And for the most part, if, from, if you were invested in Miami between 2016, 17, and today, you still did very well. Yeah. But we saw Tampa as a market that was undervalued at the time and proved to be the, the case. Certainly, there was a lot of the same positive drivers that were driving that interest in Miami, probably from 2019 to 2016, were starting in Tampa mm-hmm. with the major investment in the downtown area with Bill Gates and Vinick. Yeah. Certainly, the airport renovation projects that they were doing, a lot of big corporations were moving there, still the favorable no state income tax. So we see all those right on the wall that it was only a matter of time before that gap, that the pricing gap that you saw for a brand new townhome in Miami was a million one. That same brand new townhome in Tampa was four hundred thousand dollars. Right, yeah, huge value here. Yes. Did did you pay attention to Tampa at all before like Bill Gates and Water Street in twenty eighteen? Uh, twenty sixteen was the first time we started paying attention to it, where it started coming on that more national map for us. And I think it was twenty seventeen when we first invested in Tampa that we it was in the Tampa Heights area that we said, okay, there's something here. Yeah. And, and I think that's when we spent a significant more time in that Tampa area that we said, this is, it's only a matter of time. It, it could happen faster than most people thought it was in terms yeah. of that, that gap uh, narrowing. But I think there's still a lot of runway here in terms of what Tampa can experience because the first thing was the infrastructure, but with the airport, the downtown area. But I think over the next 15 years, you'll see the same thing that happened with Miami with these higher end real mm-hmm. estate. There's going to be yeah. more of a focus on restaurants and that that true living We're excited scene. For that. So I'm yeah. excited for the prospects of Tampa that when you hear these new restaurants opening up that are like the Sunda that just opened up, like those types of things that are great hangs that are great food versus just having places that are just mm-hmm. maybe here because there's not a lot of competition. Right. And I think also to like provide context and it's like oh, only in 2017, like all this time, like Steve was still working corporate. Right. I think we left in 20 December, 2019. So real estate was kind of a side. This was a side thing. hustle. Like December, 2019, I think is when you left corporate right before COVID. That was fun. Um, and so like it, it's all of this was built and he, he built it like, you know, behind the scenes. Like I, he first started out when he was working at PwC. Like, I mean, it's a pretty demanding, like we all, I mean, they work you for your, for what they're paying you for sure. And yep. so I think that's also like context where it's like a lot of like, this was built like, you know, in the wee hours of the night and on weekends and whatnot. But like, it took three years to like get that going in Chicago. And then they instantly knew they had to expand, but all while working. I mean, they were still working corporate. Wow. Yeah. So what was that first investment in Tampa like? We still have it. We still own it. Yeah, we bought a two unit new construction in Tampa Heights. It was a new duplex. And we looked at the proximity was a half mile from Armature Works. No, it was from, we didn't know about Armature Works at the uh, time. It true. was from Holland Franklin. Can we, we pull this one up just so I can kind of see uh, yeah, the address? Is that it's, cool? It's 102 East Euclid Avenue. Google and Maps. We, 
it, you didn't know about Armature Works at the time for this, which is even more interesting. We uh, just knew about Holland Franklin, and you went to Holland Franklin, and you called me, and you were like, "This place is this sick. is a game changer." But like, we love to. Everyone was sad. It doesn't like it's not in use right now. But and if everyone knows who owns Poke Rose and can reopen it, that would be great because yeah. that place was amazing. But yeah, that was it. Was you when you went to do your diligence, you fell in love with Holland Franklin, and then you were like, "We have to get this spot." So, yeah. Wow. So you were even <clears throat> you were up here before Armature Works. We the Hall on Franklin was a great spot. It it's was. Kinda we sad loved they closed. it. So we did not build this, but we what we, we were intrigued about is the fact that this was a two unit project at the time, 2,700 square feet that we got under contract for $450,000 as a brand new construction asset. So we were. 450, obviously, including both units. Including which, both units. A, a, an amazing price. So sub 180 a foot for a turnkey rentable duplex that was brand new construction we were building for in the time at that, that same time in chicago for 180 a foot new construction wow without the land and that was with a two-year the permitting process in chicago became a nightmare it was a nightmare so a lot of this for you was like hey this is a cool little growing area well, the story great gets price better. the story gets better because you figured it. out the zoning so when we bought this we certainly we want to build or add value and this was against everything that we normally would want to do which is buying a turn an asset that was just a market deal it was on the mls but when we saw this the survey was wrong the initial mm -hmm. one so when we had it resurveyed at the purchase it was five square feet bigger than the original survey ah. which seems immaterial but we were able to get an additional unit out of it whoa so we negotiated with the builder at that time for forty thousand dollars to build us a two-car garage and a one-bedroom apartment above the garage in the rear the rights to it wow because it had the zoning already to allow for it so at that point in time there was not a lot of people looking at tampa heights so we came in with a strong offer without con financing contingencies and that was the condition is that there's behind that there is a yeah can you drive around there tyler on the yeah, street view interesting it, there's so a you, little there's a well so it's that, an adu so yeah two car garage so you've got three units and you guys paid 490 amazing wow what a great yeah, investment. There it is. And still own it today. And still own it. So this was the first deal in Tampa. <clears throat> Did you think, I mean, obviously that's a great price. Did you look around and say, wow, Tampa's undervalued for the growth? We started coming here a lot. Yeah. Because we had this asset and we had to put it into service and stuff. And I mean, who like Tampa's a great place to visit. Yeah. Um, and we were living in Miami and we were like, oh, it can be like our escape from the Miami crazy, which mm. I really liked. And so we started spending a lot more time and we were like, like there was just a lot of, I mean, as you, like everyone who listens, like there's a lot that's special about Tampa and we're like, something is like very much clicking here. Like mm. it's a very special place. And so we were like, yeah, like this, A, we obviously needed a new market to invest in. Chicago was getting skinny. He was like at his wits end corporate and needed to like, for his mental sanity, get out of corporate. <laughs> um, and so like, then it was starting to more like look for, land specifically but then because you knew the bill costs on this one we were like okay well maybe this is where we start to go ground up and then you went in a lot more earnest to look for land in tampa mm. so this was the first kind of cash flowing asset sure. yeah yeah so we we knew that you could build for cheaper than we were building for in chicago we saw the prospects that there was going to be some increases in values as the hall on Franklin and, and that and then eventually entire we river figured out about Armature Works mm. was coming to be. And, and there was at that point in time, Armature Works was either just about to open up. And we knew that this is going to cr create some more. We didn't think it was going to be national attention. We yeah. just thought, hey, this is going to put some more localized yeah. attention that certainly South Tampa and those other markets were seeing the investment. But this area was often ignored. I think on that from an investment standpoint where we bought the first piece of land, which is across the street from that. For a hundred thousand dollars, so uh, the other way, just go on Euclid. Actually, that's probably you guys right there, so we, right? This new yeah. construction. We, we did that, yeah, but then if that. you go left, we built. That was the first new oh, construction we built in Tampa. This one right here. Oh, cool. So this was one that when we bought that land for a hundred thousand dollars, we thought we were going to be able to sell those units for about four hundred thousand. Yeah. Four twenty-five. So certainly. We were conservative on that, but we also were way off on our budgeting because we ended up spending way more on finishes than we wanted. So net net, it was still a good deal. We sold those for just under five hundred thousand, but it got it kind of got the itch that we need to find more land to do bigger scale townhomes. That was probably the at the time that was a build a grade. At the 
it was a temp- but it product. wasn't though like if you think about it like i'm thinking about it now like yeah it was builder grade but like we still had cabinets that went to the ceiling in there. Like mm. it, the bathrooms were not white shaker. Like there was a custom island. And so even back then, like at that price point, and, you know, obviously Tampa's appreciated a lot. Like if you, I don't think we had sent it over, but like that was still a very, like it felt luxe for at that price point. Right. Like how many places that are, you know, $480,000, have a 10 foot ceiling, mm. have cabinets up to the ceiling. Like, we, so they were, Within the budget that we had, like we we definitely like, it definitely wasn't builder grade. Sure. Yeah, and we were talking before the show. You guys are very design forward. You're all like you just kind of mentioned. You're very focused on the the look and the feel and the experience of your properties. It, so that sounds like from the beginning you had that kind of mantra. Is that something you had in Chicago as well? Well, Chicago, the price points were much higher. Like ah. in the sense that you the flips that you guys were doing, and obviously I wasn't as involved then. I think you were selling them like one to one point five million. So okay, like so that you had demanded... some room to, to get creative with yeah. some yeah. finishes. Yeah, and certainly they're a little bit more of a traditional buyer, and I think that's where we had the fun with the Tampa side is that we could get outside of just that mold of a traditional gabled roof type property and start mixing in some of these more moderns that we have fun with. So I think it's, you know, we've seen the designs kind of ebb and flow where we we will do a traditional, but we still, we certainly like that modern aesthetic and think back to what you were saying. Yeah. I think we started seeing that we could add luxury finishes and add really custom. And I think that's what we, not just luxury, just adding things that are not builder grade that take time, like adding accent walls, adding wine bars, adding little things that, when you're talking yeah. about, we try to build places that we'd live in mm. and think about what is it that we'd want. And we'll build these three stories, but certainly we like the two-story product yeah. just from a livability standpoint. Mm-hmm. They live like single-family homes. You could walk in, you're in your living room. You're not having to, some of these townhome products, I don't have them, or living rooms on the third floor. Yeah. and that's Or even the, worse, the kitchen. You're hauling groceries up three flights of stairs. Correct. Yeah. So and- that's... It's a niche product when you're talking that. So I, we try to, if we design spaces that we would personally live in, then we think it's one of two things. One, we're happy about the product. One, we've also lived in that first product that we built. Yeah, so we did. That, that's uh, what we ended up moving into it. To we move sold. To Tampa. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> we sold it. And then three months later. No, like three days yeah, later, we sit yeah. back. Not great from like a tax planning perspective, but. So you owned this one here and this yeah. is the three unit one you're explaining. You bought the land across the street, built, built that, it. and that's the one you moved into when you moved to Tampa. Correct. We did that for a year and then we built where we live now. And I think like that one, we had so much fun with that project, but that really was a project that we, again, we were, we wanted to live in something that we were proud of. And like, we've been doing this for at this point like, a certain amount of time. So we we're like, we want certain finishes or whatnot. But we realized Steve also is a numbers guy. Like he puts you on a budget. And so he put me on a budget for those. It was a budget. And so um, we realized through where we built, where we live now, that you could actually have something that looks really, really nice at what doesn't have to be crazy finishes budget. Mm. And so I would say where we live now, that really showed us that like you could do good design or different design. Um in a in a that way first that picture. yeah, uh, yeah that there album. it is. Yeah. So this is still like that's our that's our primary bath. It's yeah, the favorite space <laughs> I've ever designed. Just but we can like give that to like this could be accessible to everyone. And so this I would ah. say was like a very pivotal project for us in the sense of this changed our, our how we approach design. And so we realized through going through the budgeting and stuff on this that like you could do high design at a price point that was accessible in these townhomes. And like from this part forward, like we started to go much more of what you see today. Is, is a lot of that because of the feedback you got from showings and buyers? You just felt, wow, people really, really Well, no one ever it. had seen this because this is ours. Like it never went for sale. Oh, I mean, on but, like the other projects you were doing. Yes. I yes. mean, I think the, I think people appreciate it when we sold out NOCO, the, the eight unit that we did before we even broke ground on it. I think yeah. they... They weren't seeing that at the time, that the uh, not only the options, but just putting in higher quality finishes than any other person was doing. And then add it to Martine said, more of an attainable price point. Yeah. So I think that's what, you know, at this time, we were not only trying to crack the $500,000 barrier, that which really wasn't happened, we pushed over the $600,000 barrier. So we were taking more of that feel the dreams approach. Like if you build it, people will come. Mm. And 
certainly yeah. we we want it being proud of it it's still an attainable price point where we we like to invest with optionality so certainly at that price point if for whatever reason yes we're going to be into it for a lot more money but if it didn't work out we knew we could turn around and rent it and still be okay at that point in time interest rates were still very attractive so right. the, the ability to refinance at a three three and a half percent interest rate still meant that the rent though would be okay that's no longer the case mm-hmm. which means that you know now to be able to be nimble and have these deals where you almost are forced to have to sell them, if mm-hmm. you will, because it's really hard to build to rent things yeah. with a seven and a half, eight percent interest rate and then rent it out on a long term basis for that. So I think that's where we'd like to have that optionality. But when we had that with these where we said, let's go ahead and take a chance. Let's try to put really high end finishes on these and, and see how the market perceives them. And that was kind of that's the first it point and now we we're, i think we're keep we trying now. to push yeah. push the envelope we have another one coming that's going to be a few houses down that's going to be extremely nice um we're going <laughs> to try like to our pet project <laughs> so that, my next question was going to be do your ambitions go further in price and further in level of finish i mean do you level of finish yes i i mean price is always on what it models i think it's like we it still needs to be fun, right? Like at the end of the day, like I I think like Steve is really good. It's like you have this like one life to live and he's like someone who like really likes to enjoy and like, you know, if you're working for yourself, like he wants to enjoy it. And so like these projects need to be fun for us at the end of the day. Like there's a reason you left corporate, right? You still, still works like insane hours, but like it needs to be fun. And like when we do different finishes or where we push the envelope on architecture or whatever it might be, like that's fun for us. Mm -hmm. Can we, mean, can we explore that new pet project? Can we talk about you, address and stuff like that? I put it on the website. I it's think. on the website. Yeah, so we have Wood, Woodrow is going to be another one. I mean, we're Woodrow's talking about trying awesome. to do, uh, if you scroll down a little scroll bit, down. it's just the you exterior should. rendering. That's the one that's available right now. But I think beautiful. those, are, those are high-end rentals that we'll be putting out in the next few months. Uh, yeah, a little bit further down. Uh, the one on the right, these but both should. these, I mean, the one on the right, we're doing 11 foot ceilings on first floor, second floor. We're going to do floating staircases. Wow. Both units will have, uh, pools, private pools. Private oh, pools. Cool. So for the first, like this, uh, this is where I think like he does a good job. Like he tries, so Woodrow has an option for a private pool on two of the units. There's three units there. And so like, we keep trying, like no one's done that yet. And it's like, I mean, last summer in Tampa was disgusting. Like, it was so hot. And I tell them, I'm like, I need a pool. I need, and you're like, you're from the Caribbean. I am. But like, this is like, this is next level. What part of the Caribbean? Trinidad. Oh my gosh. I feel like it's way hotter there, right? Way more humid. Yes. Maybe they get more of a breeze. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. But I just remember last summer being like, it is so hot. And so we're like, okay, well, let's put some, like, people want pools in in Florida. Oh, yeah. That's not weird. But. You probably couldn't get much of a pool, no? I it's, mean, it's a, it's a dip sitting pool. area. A dip pool, uh, sitting it's a dip. area. So we'll, the, the one but on the, someone's going to want that oh, dip pool. Oh, I think pool. so. You oh, can yeah. get yeah. a 10 by 20 pool. Wow. So yeah. it's not insignificant. It's not a hot tub, but it's not. That's pretty good size you're, you're, for a townhome. Michael so Phelps is not put, coming over yeah, to, right. to, I mean, to practice. Right. We're not having Kitty Ledecky with her no, like, no, long no. distance. But also, like we, another thing that we do a lot, like Steve cares about this a lot, too. When we design our, our floor plans and whatnot, we do try to put backyards where we can, mm-hmm. right? Like, we want it to be living like a single-family home. Like, that's that's always the feel we want to give. You Most single-family homes have a backyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people care a lot more about backyards than they do about front yards. True. It makes a lot of sense. And so, yeah, you will still live in a townhouse and you have a dip pool, but, like, that's pretty single-family-ish. It's really, really pretty. Great design. The one on the right is amazing, too. We talked before we went live about, maybe we were live, but we talked about the addition, how you guys love that architecture. This looks very similar on Francis. We'd be lying if we said we didn't take any inspiration from that. I mean, certainly we're trying to, we like the rounded columns uh, that the addition has. Mm -hmm. So certainly trying to bring that to to reality here. Those are going to be rounded poured in place like limestone finishes on the columns really cool as well as the horizontal accents between the the floor to ceiling windows i'm sure hector's listening to this and is so excited yeah Who's Hector? hector's the, our gc and he's probably like oh god <laughs> can we talk about that relationship too because you said in the beginning you you uh use an external gc sure. now you have one in-house so tell me about that we transition love hector. so it started as you know as we went to the more customizations we we first few jobs we did hire out third-party 
GCs to, to build the products. And certainly from a scalability standpoint, there is that going for them. But we were running into issues whenever it came time for when Martine was picking out some finishes or trying to create these customizations that we were getting significant pushback mm. on. This is not the type of product the, if we want to do custom that they need to find a different builder. So we basically said, well, we're not going to change who we are. We wanted to continue to put this custom product out there. So we said, let's create it, bring a team. Let's, and we took some, these were sub, super con, uh, subcontractors that worked for us. We took the superintendents that worked for us and give them the reins. So they handle the oversight, the, the day-to-day management of the construction side. But there's certainly a little bit of an expectation that we are going to be able to deliver our buyers and our renters a very high-end custom finishes. And, and they've done great with it, not without heartburn and, and no. late nights, but, yeah. you know, certainly the expectation. And, and I think they appreciate this, too. Like, at the end, they'll, they'll walk They're into the project. They're proud of what they put out. Like, oh, they'll, yeah. they'll bring their spouses over, and, like, it's just, like, they're super proud about what they're putting out, too. And it's, like, again, like, we want we want people to be excited about it. And, like, it, they, we want them to be excited about their jobs, too. Like, that's the whole point. Well, there's not many builders getting to build stuff like this in Tampa Heights. I mean, there, there's a few builders that are very design forward, of course. You guys are certainly one of them. But I haven't seen a lot of this. I mean, this is gorgeous. So I would imagine they feel very proud. You know, they're like, oh, this is cool. We Once work it's on finishes and unique. it's like done. I'm sure like window install it's, day is always fun. Well, of course, yeah, <laughs> there's, I'm there's, sure there's, during the construction, they're like, uh, you know. There's gives and takes. I mean, certainly yeah. as it relates to construction, if you're building single family homes, a lot of times it's, it's a cookie cutter approach. You build your wall, you can put your frame in on top of it, you put your roof. We have not built the same product. Mm. So every single plan is different. Every single truss layout is different. So anytime we realize that there was a mistake made, we don't have the next project to get it right on because the next project project's already wrong. Or sorry, it's already different. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> Hector. Yes. I'm sure uh, that's so, a challenge. Uh, it is a challenge. But I think like at like when when we started like the the construction business with Hector when you started like like this was what we were gonna do I, I mean like like Hector Hector was the he was the project manager for something that we had built before and we like loved working with him so like he knew what we were doing and like this is all like I mean these are things that he's proud of too it's his work right? mm-hmm. if you think about it, like these things are coming to life because of like his hard work yeah and so like we we want him to be proud of it too. That's awesome. So he was the project manager and you helped him get his GC license and he was already in the process, process. of doing that. And so we he helped was, him sign up his and, business. And it, oh nice. It, it worked out well because the, the builder at that point in time that he was working for retired. So it wasn't like we were stealing anyone's uh, project manager. Yeah. So it was a very above board process. But we said, look, you know, we loved working with you. Once you actually do have your license, let's talk because we had we showed him our pipeline at that point in time of all the projects that we had going on. And it made a lot of sense for both of yeah. us to say, look, this is what we had a pretty good, clear vision of what we wanted. And it was we already knew that he had the experience. And, and that that was, it was definitely a, an alignment there to say, look, let's continue this this process that we yeah. already have in place. And how long has he been your GC in-house? Three years now. Mm-hmm. That I, That's probably a pivotal point in your business, right? Having your yeah. own general contractor to control this design build. It, it, it was never... When I started in 2013, that was always something that I probably told myself that I would never actually want to do in-house just because I knew all the pain points that comes from mm. the construction side and then the, the warranty and the back end stuff that from a scalability standpoint. But I think because of our design first type of customizations, it's, it was a force mechanism to say, look, we want to be who we are, be you know, continue to put these things out there. And if that means that we're going to have to spend this much more time uh, and kind of curate this design and build team, then that's how we're going to be able to handle it. I think mm. the other part of it, too, is, like, uh, we were doing a lot in 2020. I mean, we all know what happened at construction costs in 20. I mean, it was just, like, wild. Um, and so that also, like, it uh, like again, if you go back to we're investors first, then developers, then builders, it's, like, in order for the investment business to do well, like, we had to get more control over some of these costs. And, like, I think, like, Builders, are, was it 2021, 2022? Like, there were, like, 20-week lead times for trusses in Florida. Like, yeah. it was insane. And, like, that's very expensive and holding costs. And so, I mean, <laughs> Steve figured out how to get trusses from Indiana. And, like, that's how we kept things moving. And a lot of people would be like, no, this is my supplier. Like, this is where my relationship is. Like, it's just how long it's going to take. And, like, by bringing that in-house and working with Hector, it's like, we're going to keep the project moving and we're just going to figure out a way to get trusses from Indiana and, and whatever it might be. And so I think like 
that's also been like Hector's amazing, but it's like also he works with us on some of these ways that we try to figure out how to make these designs. Again, we're not selling these things for $3 million. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of hurricane impact glass that we have to install. Oh, yeah. And so again, like there, there are, Steve does a really good, like he finds a lot of ways to add value, but he's not cutting corners on what the consumer is getting and what right. they're going to feel. And so, yes, we've figured out ways to get these like mass amounts of glass that are impact and import them. And so, and like figuring out where to get the trusses. And I think like that is all possible by bringing the construction in house, but it's also like Hector is very, like you guys have a great working relationship and they work together to be able to do those types of things. Like no one wants to sit on a project for four no. months because you don't trust it. Yeah, no. Yeah, what was 2020 like for you guys? I mean, I'm sure it scared you in the beginning. Sounds like you worked certain, your way out of certainly it. Certainly, I've been, I've never been through a down cycle or that type of event. I don't think anyone experienced a event like that with the rapid inflation. So I think it was it's a learning exp experiment. You know, I think that went to still the first thing is just trying to make sure you're buying right. Mm -hmm. And we were able to luckily buy our land at the right prices so that because we had some fixed price contracts and certainly with the rapid increases in prices, you're definitely we're in a tough spot. But you know, we we did still find that you do have it goes all to your relationships and we were able to make sure that we were not completely eating it on everything. But yeah, it was a great learning experience. I don't know. Hopefully we don't have to experience a 2020 event again. But as oh, Martine said, again, it was trying to be nimble. I mean, we yeah. wanted these projects to keep moving. So we were able to call trust companies that were not busy in Missouri, Indiana, and said, look, make these trusses for us. They were still keeping their costs where they were. They didn't want to burn these builders. And we just hired trucking companies to bring them to Florida. And we were able to keep the pro some of these projects moving. The same thing was on other materials that we're seeing those issues with drywall, insulation, windows, doors, a lot of things we're seeing these delays. So it's just trying to, again, be, you know, rather than just taking the surface where if you called three tr trust companies in Tampa, they would have just said, we'll, we'll talk to you in six, seven months. Wow. Some people might have yeah. just taken that on the surface to say, okay, that that's the answer. Uh, I'm a little more hard headed for <laughs> better or worse and don't don't usually like that as the answer. So yeah. kind of said, look, well, let's figure out another solution here because, you know, ultimately we're trying to look out for our investors and and our team to make sure that we can keep them busy. And, and that was via trying to put these trusses on so we can move on and start another project. Yeah. It, was that a relationship you had from up in Illinois? It, it was not. It was a expedition in using the amazing search of Google. Wow. Uh, yeah. You call a lot of trust. Uh, I, I think no, a well, trust you went company like, you near went like, me. Enter. It was like yes. state by state. So I think you started then looking started at Georgia, Georgia and Alabama, and they were like, "Oh, like Jacksonville builders had already tapped into Georgia, mm, right?" Yeah. They were like, "That's just easy. That, that makes, makes sense." sense. So I, right? yeah. I skipped some states. So then at that point, we're like, "Oh, we gotta get further away from Florida." So we yeah, <laughs> leaped to the Midwest. Well, Florida during that time, I mean, and we kind of still are. Are, but it was a building boom 2018 exactly. 19, as you guys know so i'm sure there was a ton of contractors we, looking for product at well, that when time. we were calling georgia and south carolina they're like you're the 10th call today right yeah yeah like they're like we're not built for this type of volume so that's why we just skipped some states we skipped kentucky skipped some, some other states and we went so, we went into yeah. the heartland. sorry geography wasn't my strong suit but i think i got that hail right. mary but, up yeah. to uh all the way you say, indiana indiana missouri missouri yeah, yeah. and that's awesome it was, it was, you know, certainly their structure, the same as trust engineering, right? They're building them according to the Florida specifications. They're building them according to like what the engineers design. There's a small network. I mean, we're good friends with the C C yeah. homes guys. So there was a lot of people that would share contacts. Oh, nice. Because like, especially yes. at our volume. I mean, certainly we're not calling Lennar up and saying where you're getting your trusses from because that's what effectively was happening. The big trust companies, Builders First, Tibbets, just shut down all custom trusses. They were only doing production building trusses. Oh, so yeah. all of the smaller so developers. So we had, we had contracts with Tibbets at that time for them to build our trusses. And they just said, here's your deposit back. We will not be delivering us your trust. We will not be delivering this to you. Oh, my gosh. And, and look, but those like the the larger and like the track, like they also were experiencing a boom. Like, if it, like Florida was booming. And so in... in in Tibbet's defense, right, like they could keep their people working. They had a certain amount and they could just build the exact same trust 10 times more than having to deal with our yeah. custom thing. Right. And so it's just like nothing against Tibbet's. It's just like people have to do business. But at a certain point, like it was like in that type of a boom. Yeah. The smaller business is sometimes going to have to mm. get more creative. And for us, 
we ended up. Well, they burned us twice because yeah. we signed a contract with a company out of Brooks, Brooksville. And about three months later, they said we were just acquired by Tibbet. <laughs> oh, and, and we can no longer honor your trust contract. And I'm like, Sorry. you got to be kidding me. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So then we were so, like, like, we're going far. So ironically enough, Tibbetts reached out to us about uh, six months ago. We see all your projects. We'd love to get involved again. And I said, thank you, but no, thank you. Buddy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Peace out. Yeah. Um, back to these new projects you have going on. Can you scroll down, Tyler? What are the price points on these new ones you have coming up? The um, So those ones you're scrolling past right now are rentals. The one, the, the, these, these ones here, the one sales. that looks like these. So, uh, Francis Woodrow. and Woodrow. Yeah, so we're Woodrow will probably be just over a million. Uh, those units are anywhere from 2,600 to 3,000 square feet heated. Wow. So under a roof, they're, they're about 4,000 square feet. So they're really big townhome units with really big yards. Uh, so those, yeah, will probably be in the 1.05 to 1.3. So just a little over 400 bucks a foot. So the, for the price point, wow. they, these are going to have really high end finishes. It's still a half mile to Armature Works. So we think that's going to be a great product. Yeah, OWA we're, did a great job on those. They were the architect. That's incredible. I mean, that's a very reasonable price point for this, I mean, amazing architecture. So do you credit that to kind of everything we've talked about, right? In-house GC, you really couldn't offer this product through an outside GC. So OWA did that one. And I mean... The architecture. The architecture. So they, they killed it. Body did a great job yeah, on they it. Did. And so the, um, so we're excited about those. That's our first project with them. Um, and they're the ones that came up with the idea for a private pool and a townhome. So all the credit to Body. I love that. Um, and so we, those will... I we want to make sure yeah. that there's... We're not trying to be greedy. I mean, no. ultimately, we love their... We'll try to make a little bit of money, but if, if we could put a attractive price point out there and put really high end finishes, that's gonna get these to move. And I think that's been some of what we've been known for is that there's people that reach out yeah. and says, "We want to know what's your next upcoming project," because mm -hmm. it seems like as soon as something hits the market, it, it it moves. And I think there's some element where we could take pride in that. That there is some level of yeah. following there that we could put the product out there, not try to maximize every single dollar, and then these projects can move. So then we could take those investor resources and, and move towards the next project. Yeah. 316 we haven't priced yet. No. But, but that one is special. That those are about 3,400 square feet. Wow. Those are very large. With South townhomes. of Columbus, rooftop and pool. No one's done that yet. Rooftop and pool. And yeah. from the rooftop up there, it's a little hilly. You probably have a beautiful view of downtown. You, you might, or a Toronto. very nice view of a Mobley Homes custom build. Um, one of the two <laughs> on Ross. One of the two. <laughs> um, but yeah, no one. So we've done a few rooftops. People really love rooftops, which Stephen and I don't personally understand. We're much more of the ground floor, open it out, entertaining. But like with feedback, we always get is we want a rooftop. Mm. So we're like, okay. And people want pools. So people what they want at 316 Francis. Well, backyard, pool, and rooftop are three things that, I mean, you can't really have well, a backyard. Well, in a townhouse, you can't really have a pool. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, you gotta, you gotta you pick gotta choose one. one. So on um, Francis, are these on pretty large lots? I mean, backyard-wise. Yeah, have a nice so backyard? those are 8,000 square foot lots. So that will have about a 30 by 30 backyard. So about 1,000 total square feet. And that's going to have a about a 300 square foot covered porch. So it's not small, but certainly if you do take the pool, then you're going to be putting 10 by 20 square right. foot of uh, coverage or for a pool for that plus the coping. But yeah, I mean, if someone didn't want a pool, then they'd have a, about a thousand square foot yard, which is not no that at it's that point nothing. in time, that's not nothing. No. That's like what we have. Yeah. It works really well. Yeah, it's not bad at all. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about, <clears throat> we kind of spoke earlier about the growth in Tampa Heights, but back to Armature Works, when that first was announced, you guys didn't know about it. Um, what was it like when you had already bought something in Tampa Heights, you go into Armature Works for the first time and you see all the venues and the people and, you know, did you think, it, wow, this it, is going to be something? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it doesn't take much. I mean, certainly we loved Holland Franklin, as she was alluding to earlier. And I thought that was special. I mean, yeah. just like taking a hundred year old special. We loved it. Building in uh, like those in a that street like that close to the downtown area with that food hall concept. And every time we came here, we spent our Fridays and Saturdays there, At and it was bustling. I mean, there was people there. So just that got us excited. So it's, Armature Works is a game changer. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's no question about it. So as soon as we walked into that the first time, we I immediately probably told her, Tampa Heights, right. The fact no, that I we think didn't he was like, I think you, call, like, I don't know if I was there, or not, but we went first time you walked into Armature Works, 
he he was like, I'm putting all my money in Tampa. Uh, he put all his money in Tampa Heights. Yeah, that's and that's so kind of what I was getting that's to. That's kind yeah. of like we we put, I mean, now like we've re-diversified and whatnot. But like at that time, you were about to quit your job or just quit your job. It was, anyways, we went, he was like, I'm going all in on Tampa Heights. Love and it. you went all in on Tampa Heights for a couple of years. And recently we've started to, I've been like, okay, well. Diversify. Let's go back to the I mean, principles of diverse Michelin investing. Star restaurant in we Tampa do. Heights. It yeah. is so good. Best so bread good. there is. I we like everyone who asks us about the restaurant scene in Tampa, we talk about Roca bread. Oh, it's so best. good. It's the bomb. Everything at that restaurant's incredible. We have to get you each have to get our own bread when we go <laughs> because like one cannot share. That's not okay. Yeah. Yeah, we get we get the weird eye. They're like, we're you, like, you, know you want to? Sure? We're you know like, like two loaves of bread. We're, we're like, aware. We know. Bring it on. Yeah. Please bring it you. on. So that sold that development sold you on Tampa Heights. And now they've built the Pearl and yep. more retail. Yeah. They have oh. the Pearl phase two coming we, in. We didn't even think that was necessary. I mean, certainly that those projects, the Heights Union was what way before. I mean, there was a master plan put out that we saw like in 2016, 2017 that talked about a hotel, that talked about a, a grocery store. Office and all that. But yeah. All that was additive. Like I think we just saw that. That close the to the river walk, yeah. that type of mixed use complex is going to drive people that want to live, work, and play in that type of Tampa Heights area. Because at that point in time, it was a third of the price is Hyde Park or North Hyde Park. And no one was paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. There was a very few people that were really starting to invest in that area. So I think what we were kind of saw from like a niche standpoint is there wasn't a lot. Being an urban infill, there's not a lot of available dirt. A lot, so that's going to yeah. scare away a lot of the bigger track builders, is because they couldn't just go put seventy five townhomes in a certain area because there was only you're buying quarter acre land sites. So I think you know, certainly you see it on the tertiary parts of the neighborhood with low Kai Capitals putting their three hundred unit apartment building and some of these other projects that are going up. But if in terms of like these urban infill mm -hmm. developments, which is where we've focused. Certainly townhome projects. It, it, it lends to more of that single family home and, and townhome product. And what we liked about the townhome product is rather than being forced, forced is a strong word, but rather than having to sell a single family home for a million to 1.5 million, we were able to sell at that point in time townhomes for five, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000. Yeah. So it's appealing to a lot more buyers. You're certainly able to yeah. still focus on the high de high demand for like that that entry level price point but at like with a luxury of finishes because that was we were trying to appeal to that post covid buyer where people wanted to get out of condos they wanted to get out of apartments they wanted to have still those walkable amenities but have a balcony have right. a little yard yeah. space yeah. it didn't have to be significant but people did like that's what drove us away from Miami we were in an elevator building in, in Miami, and during COVID, it could take us 20 minutes to go downstairs because it was- Because everyone's using the elevator. Well, everyone's, they were like, and you had like limited amount of people in it. two person per elevator right. yeah. law that and I, didn't, I didn't follow that, but other people would look at you in. like you just stole from them if you, you walked into the elevator to, to get downstairs. Yeah, it's tough. Like, I'm not walking up 23 flights of stairs. Yeah, heck not no. not 24, whatever it was. No way. But I think also, like, the thing that's cool about Town Bison Town Home product, and it's, like, you can live this, like, suburban indoors lifestyle, right? You have space and everything like that. But, like, you're still living an urban, like, you're next to downtown. You're walking to Armature Works. Like, you're in the middle of everything. everything like, anywhere yeah. you want to get, you're getting there from time, in 10 minutes from Tampa Heights. And, like... We, we love that personally. So we're like, we, we also build what we love, which is like, I mean, maybe good, maybe bad. And so like, we realize that a lot of people like don't want to move to the full on suburbs. Like they're not ready to do mm -hmm. that yet, but they're ready to get out of an apartment they want to own. And so that really is like the niche. And like, also when we build, we, we build and we design, like, I remember when we were doing Ross, like at one point we were walking through Ross and we were like, should we just move in here? And we like talked about that for like, two weeks and I was like I don't actually want to move three blocks away because that's a lot of work to move in and to pack but like we also like start to think about like we want it to be somewhere where people like we would be proud to live there we would live there and so that's what we want like we're putting a product out that we would live in that's incredible and then <clears throat> prices have obviously appreciated a tremendous amount since Armature Works really right kind of when you guys got here is when everything yeah. skyrocketed I think COVID had a lot to do with that it was I always say COVID was an accelerant I think 
everything that's happened, all of the amazing development in Tampa probably was inevitable, but COVID just forced people to move Correct. here super early. Has it been challenging for you guys to offer products at affordable prices? I mean, land right now is like crazy expensive, especially in Tampa Heights. What's been challenging is just finding good land opportunities. And I think that's the part where we're probably not going to change who we are in terms of the resale price. That's going to be set by the market. But just to be able to find land and be able to put our product out there, we need to find the land at a cheap enough price point. I think to your point, you're spot on. I mean, at Come 2019, 2020, there was more land opportunities than there was investor capital that I was, mm. had available for us to be able to invest in the Tampa market. People were willing to, for every dollar they wanted to put into Tampa, they wanted $2 in Chicago or one of our other markets that we were looking at. So for us, it was a little bit of a challenge to try to sell people because if they came to Tampa Heights, they were like, I don't see this vision yet. Mm. So you're or trying like you to tell people that it was too early at that in the, time. In it their was, mind, it was too early. Google, yeah. So it, it, to your, I thought that there would be a five or 10 year runway where it's like, look, there's going to be opportunities here for a while. I don't, it's going to get better. And they're like, okay, well, talk to me on the next deal. And right. there we'll really see. wasn't those types of, it, to your point, as soon as 2020 hit, the millions of people that migrated to, to Florida, a lot of the, not only was the migration of there, the the high network investor capital was also coming to Tampa, put some eyes on these markets, and it wasn't too long where Tampa was seeing that 20, 25% annual is increased. So yeah, it, it certainly made it more challenging to be able to find those opportunities. I think we continue to try to stay lean where we can, again, only take on four or five projects at any point in time where we don't need to find a 100, 200 unit type of development because everything we do is on an individualized basis. We're not trying to raise a committed fund and then we're forced to do deals whether they're good deals or not and i think that's where you can kind of get in trouble because certainly at 2013 when we i first started it was like what, did, what is this going to become like you didn't really know and when i as martin said when i first quit my job i i had a hard time thinking about real estate because before i even got into it full-time and started the business it was i was like i'm going to get professional education like i'm going to go work for a developer and try to work under them for two or three years and I was applying. I had thought I had a decent resume background and I would get a few interviews. And I, I remember one time I was telling Martin the story the other day where I would go through the entire round of interviews and I was killing it. Like they were, every single person was laughing at every joke. I would say they were <laughs> impressed with my background. They were talking about like, you know, the first deal I did where we saw like marijuana in the basement and we, in Chicago and we were trying to evict these tenants and they're like, that's not how you're going to evict your tenants. And we're like, so the learning, police was like, we don't care. Learning things in Chicago. We're like, you know, so you're telling these stories. We're like, yes, apparently that's not enough rules to be able to evict someone in Chicago if they're dealing drugs. So telling, you're, you know, telling these stories during the interview process and kind of migrated across where, you know, they pass you from one manager to the next. And by the end of the process, I'm in the CEO's office. And thinking, okay, I'm going to get a job offer. Like, this will be great. I get to start with this, this real estate fund. And she picks up my resume. She's like, why are they wasting my time? I'm like, says that. Yeah. First thing she says to me, and I'm like, come again? And I'm like, like, I'm just shocked. I'm like, what? she's like, I don't know why they're wasting my time. I'm like, I start, I'm sorry. Like, she's like, you have zero real estate experience. Like, I was like, I was just at a loss. Like, I was like, yeah. It's like, I have, been working on real estate privately for four years, talked about all these deals. She's like, I don't care about that. She's like, you do not have any professional real estate experience. I'm like, okay. So that was pretty much like yeah, a, you try, like, I was a Kickstarter year. where it was like, okay, I'm going to, again, my resume wasn't nothing. I mean, as Martin alluded to, like I, I work with. Like, you, I mean, he has four or five years of PwC. I worked at a private then equity fund. Like, private equity had, fund. Like, it was like, you had a good resume. Yeah. yeah. It was just not the conventional resume. Correct. Mm. And for them, it was just like, I thought that was, I was selling it to everyone else. Like, this is a net positive because real estate, so I feel like it's sometimes you need to think outside the box. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, you can get in trouble if everyone's just like, this is the one way of thinking about types of opportunities. So, and that's where everyone else that I was talking to that particular day was loving that. They're like, yeah, we absolutely need new thinkers outside of the box thinkers. And the CEO just shot yeah. that down. So and rather then you than pivoted, and you're so like, rather than trying to focus on getting into like the corporate space, it's like why not just give it a chance to say, look, we have, a, we don't need a lot of types of opportunities to be able to find this to say, can we do this by ourselves? And 
she's been supportive of it the lot of hours because I kind of quit my job thinking, hey, look, this is great. I'm going to get my oh handicap gosh. down. I'm going to play golf he was all the time. So right. excited. And Retire it's been the opposite. Your handicap has it's, not gone down no. for the record. My, <laughs> it's been the opposite. You have played less golf since you quit corporate. She keeps you humble, man. I love it. Uh, she played college golf. I played college so she golf. Could, oh, so, so she, can, know, you know what you're talking about that. She yeah. can throw that at me. The one thing I have. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so it, it, Steve is definitely smarter, like faster thinking, everything better, except for ex- I have one thing. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts. Yeah, that sweet swing. But but it is it is true. Like you do, like you thought you were going to be like you're you're going to play a lot more golf, be a lot more flexible, and like you work way longer hours, much more. But at the end of the day, like you're doing something that you love. Whereas yeah, you can tell great. that's expressed in y'all's projects. I mean, the, yeah. the, like what you're building is so unique. You can almost tell like, wow, someone has really taken the time to appreciate design and, you know, they're, they're moving in a more creative flow versus kind of like you mentioned with the corporate guys. Like if the numbers don't work, we're not going to do it, et cetera. Yeah. The numbers still do have to work. Well, I've always course, come back course. to it. It's true. You're still a numbers guy at your heart. Well, you have to be right. I mean, you can't lose money. You no. you wouldn't be able to do this yeah. for long if you need, were need to pay money. the bills. That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk too about the difference between ownership in Chicago versus Tampa. Do you still own or develop property in Chicago? Yeah, we we have a couple. We just finished probably the last development there in early 2022. We converted a 12,000 square foot vacant building to a mixed use retail apartments. We were more passive in that opportunity Mm. i I, my initial skill set was like finding the deals and doing the architects floor plans that type of things i had a business partner who lives in chicago that was more of the money guy Mm. but and his wife was like an actual professional designer so so she did all the design so they handled we hired a third party gc he was the project manager for that one so my role was finding the deal and bringing it in so a lot of times that was more passive from our standpoint once we got that opportunity going but we'll still look at chicago we like chicago i don't love seeing the the reasons what drove us away is everything that was driving us thinking about florida was the bureaucracy in chicago Mm. they were driving a lot of big business away from chicago same reason why you see like ken griffin citadel they moved to miami there's been a lot of that you know there was right when we moved to chicago in 2012 the push at the time was getting walgreens and mcdonald's and google's headquarters and in Into downtown the so there was that was great that the the there was kind of a brain pushy all the all the major jobs. like they were in the suburbs and there was a lot of effort at that time to bring them downtown mm. which they did they did and then but unfortunately that's Safe. they didn't keep, keep doing those things yeah. so there's been more issues with safety and crime there and that's led to in addition to bad weather and high state income taxes has kind of started pushing and property taxes has pushed people to look at other markets. So we ultimately are still like the market. I mean, there's, I mean, our most recent acquisition was in Chicago. It was. Mm. Yeah. So you're still active. Up yeah. There, yeah. Bonnie. Yeah. I mean, there's still benefit to Chicago. Chicago is a great city. Like yeah. we love Chicago. And so it's not that we're not active there. Like I said, like the last piece of property we bought was in Chicago. Um, there's just like pros and cons to it. I think like, we were talking about it the other day, like Chicago is now attractive again in the sense, A, return to office is, is changing some things like they're like that is making Chicago and a lot of these other places like go back up and and start to like see the the rent prices and stuff again. Florida insurance is pretty expensive these days. And so like that also is changing a lot of deals, like how much that has increased. Well, prices have appreciated so quick that a lot of native Floridians are moving out in a way. And some of the yeah. young professionals that have recently graduated college are leaving the city because it's too expensive. So we've seen some negatives. Yeah. I mean, obviously we have net influx of yeah. people, but we have seen a lot of people move out of the area because it's not affordable. And I think that's why I mean, we, we invested last year in Ocala for the first time. And I think, ah. I think yeah. Ocala you're going to see becoming a younger area. I mean, certainly it's known for like the equestrian and being a little bit more closer to the villages and be more senior retirement. But I think the same kind of trends that you'd see with like the Naples and those types of areas that it won't, it won't ever get to those types of price points, but people that to your point are escaping this, but still want the the weather. You're 
kind of still close to Ocal Orlando, Tampa mm -hmm. airports, so you can still be in it. I think those are this kind of the tertiary markets are going to see a little bit more of the growth than yeah. probably necessarily pushing it all the way up to That's a good Chicago point. again. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we like we, we invested last year in Waynesville, North Carolina. We bought a self storage facility there. It was same thing. We went to go visit it, saw a lot of bigger developers building big apartments, big buildings, big bringing bi businesses there. They didn't want like, Asheville at that point in time exploded. Like, just prices in Nashville went crazy. And this is 20 minutes away from Nashville. So we were saying, all right, like finding these markets that there is value. You know, we, what we found with the self storage deal, someone brought it to us and we looked at it and they were selling an asset where they weren't even marketing a 8,000 square foot brick and steel warehouse building. They weren't including that in the square footage. So it was already an existing 93% occupied self storage building, but what they were forgetting is that, oh, by the way, there's just this vacant warehouse. So we took this warehouse, spent a, about $150,000 converting the 8,000 square foot warehouse to 65 more climate controlled units. Oh my gosh. And put them yeah. online. So we did, we only did that a few Talk months about ago. about value add. But yeah. that was something where, again, you take an asset where people, most people would just look at that on the surface and be like, it's already 93% occupied. The rents were already really good. Like, what can we do with it? And that was something where, again, we didn't, have a specialty in self storage, and we told the investors as such. You know, a lot of people when they were looking at the deals, like, how many self storage deals have you done? It's like none, but we know how to add value, and we think this is how we can add value, and this is what we see because it was sharing a lot line with a three hundred unit apartment building that was still under construction. So as people got stuff, it's got to go somewhere. And, wow! And that was no brainer. The intentions was that that's going to be a secondary home for them. It's a class A apartment building. They're like, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to just be using this part term, they're going from big houses to a, a thousand square foot apartment. Like, all right, well, that's a good demand driver right there. Is a big part of what you do pitch to investors? I mean, you've, you've had to raise some capital for some of these projects. No longer. Uh, cause we haven't found enough deals to have to ramp that up. So uh, it, it, it's now. been enough of an existing network where if anything, it's the other way around that they're coming to us to say, we need more deals. Like, what can you yeah. find? So it's that ebb and take that as much as you'd love to do deals for the sake of it, like so, we still want to make sure that they're getting the returns that we believe that they should. And the only way to do that is be very selective about the, the deals that we're looking at. There's more capital right now than there are deals, essentially. Think, yeah, the network of capital that, that Steve's done a really good job of building up, like they, you know. I think you've had a ton of repeat investors mm. too. So that I think also like, again, you do at the end of the day, like we work for our investors, like delivering value back to them. Like we have quite a few that just keep rolling it. And so, and like we said, like we, we have our brand, we have our small operation. And so that also like they have demand, they want more. And we're like, this is all we can take on. When the investors were saying no to you guys back um, we were kind of talking like kind of right when Armature Works was opening up. Yeah. And they were like, ah, Tampa, maybe down the road. Let us know in the next deal. Were you at the time like, no, trust me, like this is crazy down here. You got to get in. It's, it's, yes and no. I mean, certainly we want investors that do use their own judgment because none of the the first few deals were small where, yes, I would go to a friend. But at this point in time, these were true third parties that I had very little mm. working relationship with. And that was always something that I, I've never lost a dollar of investor capital and I don't plan to. Yeah. And I think we've that we'd lose our own money our own before. Money before we, it, we but we've always it. returned their capital. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where if someone's saying to us that this is not the deal for them, usually we the conversation would just stop there. Uh, you know, certainly we put in the deck, it had visions of this and if they just say we don't see the vision like thank that's you we'll, we'll you know we'll show you tell you how the progress is going and we'll get you on the next one and that's usually been our push because there's nothing worse than if for whatever reason all of a sudden it ends up like i don't want to have like i told you so type of conversations with investors we're like why did you push me so hard and it's like look you make it an intelligent decision there is a risk of capital loss again we hope that's never going to be the case but that's why we wouldn't probably yeah. ever go to that far with it got it that makes sense. Keep uh, it with what we I had. Handle. If anything, I have to push her to say, is it okay if I uh, forgo us going on vacation this year for us <laughs> to buy this other project? That's so that's the, that's the toughest sell yeah. is to say, I know this will be a good deal. Like, trust me, like we need to buy this deal. Yeah. And, and usually I have 
my biggest critics is trying to get her to to get behind something and if I feel like if I get her to say, yeah, we can do that project, then it's like, all right, the rest is going to fall in place. That's the golden seal. That's, that's right it. There. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the future of Tampa, um, you guys have been here, I guess, coming since what, 2013, right? Maybe 10 plus ish uh, years. I, I mean, spent in Florida, 30 years in, in Tampa in particular, four years now. We've lived here for four and, years. And just those four years, there's so much change. What do you guys think about the future of Tampa? I mean, do you see a vision where Tampa Heights is near fully built out with all this new construction and, and that Armature Works project actually goes through and that whole area has hotels and office? I mean, do you think in the and next... That's, that's committed. I mean, that's so committed. yes. Yeah. I mean, the, from talking to the Armature Works developers, from talking to Allison Development about their pr- project that they're proposing, they own six acres, or that own, YMCA owns six, yeah. six acres just south of Columbus all the way up to Palm. So there is about $2 billion of planned projects that are committed. So it's just a question of, they're just sequencing this out to not use all their investor dollars in a quick period of time. So my expectation is all the way from the publics that'll be just south of North Boulevard, which is not really Tampa Heights, it's more of like West River. Right. All the way up to- But it'll serve it. MLK all the way east to 275 and all the way south is is going to be a completely different community 10 15 years from now but it also had lend benefit from gas works and stuff and and then well water, water street, street phase two and beyond exactly. all of that so like i think it's like when you look at it they're all so close on the map like it is a hundred that's like, what's interesting about yeah. tampa to me is like all of these huge huge projects we're talking about are in such close proximity to a point where yeah. you could walk between them or take maybe the trolley one day between them that's our dream our dream is that the trolley starts to go up to tampa heights we're like that would be so awesome. Pull up the old, type in uh, trolley map, 1940s Tampa. You know, the trolley in Tampa used to go all around the city, all the way up to Sulphur Springs, all the way down to Bayshore Boulevard and Ballast Point, Port Tampa. I mean, West Tampa, everywhere. Yeah. Look at this. Uh, go hit images. That actually might be it, Tyler, that first one you picked. Check this out, though. This was in, yeah, Tampa Streetcar, that one. Look at this. Look at the trolley network Tampa used to have. I mean, it used to go everywhere, all through Tampa Heights, right West well. Tampa, yeah. down to Palmacia, Howard Avenue. Back. Bring that back. Can you imagine if all of this development gets built and I think we had it. some sort of a system like this? They'll need it because of, I mean, certainly whenever you sit in on those zoning meetings, the council meetings, the neighborhood meetings about any of these large scale proposed projects, it's the first pushback that the neighbors will say is, but where are you going to park everyone? So I think that's the the biggest shift from maybe a, a native Tampanian, is it? Is that the right way of saying it? Is? Some people say tampon, Tampanian. Yeah, I, 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 I like Tampanian, yeah. Sure, so we'll go with that. So the uh, the shift you hear here is that, you know, where are you going to park these cars? Whereas if you're coming from a Boston, New York, these bigger markets, Chicago, no one thinks about parking because, you know, like we, I didn't have a car when I was in Chicago. Yeah, if when I, you visit. I mean, even if you visit, you don't need to rent a car. You do not. No, so you I, just I take, think take the there's the L. there's certainly some. Uh, I think it's a safer, more walkable area. So it's kind of like what do what is it they want the city to become? Because if mm. they want it to become that, then you you have to almost force less parking. Because right now, Armature Works has got every single surface parking lot around Armature Works. People will park there instead of parking in the two thousand parking spot at above Sprouts. That's the yeah. plan. The plan is that people would have to park at that parking garage or above Sprouts, but out of just pure ease, people will just park in the adjacent parking lots. In the next ten years, those parking lots will be gone. Right. They'll be replaced with the Heights Union, another office building, another apartment building. So the, yeah, the hope is that if again, if you want to go to Armature Works, coming from Seminole Heights, coming from Wesley Chapel, coming from Lutz, coming from anywhere else, you're going to either have to make the decision to take an Uber, take a public transportation. And hopefully that's what it is. If you're coming from Water Street, right now people probably got in their car to go from, we do it. We, we go from, to Water Street we street. drive to Water Street from Tampa Heights. <laughs> if the trolley had a stop in Tampa oh, we Heights. Would be those pe- we would be on it every Friday night. I love it. Yeah. That's such a good question. Like what, the, the city should ask that question, right? Like what do we want to become? And you also have to think, you know, do we have a choice? I mean, there's so many people moving here. Do, shouldn't we be more, I don't know, growth management oriented and go ahead and try something like this out. It's obviously super complicated and there's so many different entities and bureaucracy, et cetera, but 
damn, I'm afraid that if we don't invest in infrastructure like a streetcar or some sort of public transportation, what the the whole city is going to be gridlocked by the time they build Water Street and gas works and all this it stuff. It doesn't even need to be like any formal thing. Like even, I mean, I don't know how many people, I've never been on Harp. I've never taken a public bus in Tampa, mm-hmm. but in Chicago, when, oh my gosh, the that bus was all we took. All we really, took. the bus in it Chicago. Was, it was a yeah, lot so cleaner and easier than, than the L. L. Sometimes. Once you learn the buses in Chicago, game changer. Sometimes buses have stigma. They're dirty. Oh, and, of course. Yeah. And that's what but Tampa like, needs to change. Yeah. 100%. Like, what I would, again, if we could walk to, we're currently with a lot of these parks in places in Tampa Heights, you're two blocks from North Boulevard or right. Tampa Street that can go right downtown. Mm-hmm. But we don't think to, about taking correct. the bus to do that. But if we can just pop out, walk a couple blocks, hop on the bus, and you're down in, at Water Street, you're at Amelia. Yeah, no Amelia car, Arena, no parking. No car. Yeah, hell yeah. You think about New York and Chicago and some of these cities, like, when you're like, there's a stigma, like, there are CEOs on these buses and on, like, the Metra every day in Chicago and on the L, right? And right. it's like, it doesn't have, like, like, it doesn't have to have this stigma if it works and if it's efficient, right? Like at the end of the day, if public transportation works and it's efficient, that will make someone keep it like upkeep it. Right. Yeah. So that then, then people will use it. The more people use it, the more city, the city has to upkeep it. And it's like this vicious cycle. And if it works and it's efficient, people are going to use it. Mm -hmm. And forcing people to do it, Financially, because yeah. in New York, you won't just walk out of your house and where are go you drive, parking that car? Because where right, are you going to park yeah. it? Or you're going to spend forty bucks for parking at the restaurant when you can spend ten dollars for Ubers each way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right now, it's there is the choice because you can drive to Water Street and maybe pay ten bucks for parking. So it's like, which one do they want it to be? If they have the surface parking right now, use it. Certainly, the hope or our vision or are we love wish. all the seven one seven parking gar- lots to to be replaced with beautiful high rises and re- retail. And that will make the city more re- walkable because you're replacing hundreds of surface parking lots with now more restaurants and options for people to use. So yeah. it, it'll happen, you know, hopefully uh, it'll happen sooner than later. But I think if you're looking at Tampa 15, 20 years from now, it's going to be unrecognizable with the, the skyline and the, yeah. in these, cool. these immediately surrounding pockets in terms of the density that they'll have with the gas works, the Tampa Heights projects everything in the Midtown project are going to be completely game changers for the area. I think so too. I'm excited for the future. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, thank you guys for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. Uh, do you want to kind of shout out your Instagram website, stuff like that? Let people know how to find you guys. We are Skyline Are you the brainchild? No, I'm not. <laughs> we, we hired a social media, um, Brie, who does it for us. And she's, oh, that's why it's very active now. Um, Skyline 41 Homes on Instagram. I think we're on TikTok now too. Oh, TikTok. I yes, we might s- not have a, any dances yet. We were, we, my, my goal is to get all my carpenters one day to do some nice little TikTok dance. There I you think go. we're also Skyline 41 Homes on TikTok. Um, and then Skyline it's 41.com. It's a unique name. Google Skyline 41 if you're having trouble, people. Yeah, it, it, it was a fun name from when you were in Chicago. <laughs> That's how we named yeah. it. So ah, we named it. interesting. I was on the 41st floor of a rental apartment building and it had, it had a few... nice little views of the skyline. So sure enough. And I'm so the, glad it, you said it because I forgot to ask. The it, name. Was, it, was, it was the name of your Wi-Fi and then you had to create an LLC <laughs> for the deal that you were investing in that started it out and you're like, oh, just I already came up with this name, so I'll just use this name. I love it. But we, like I said, we loved our time in Chicago and the name brings us a lot of joy. Amazing. Well, listen, you guys are building incredible products and I appreciate you bringing that to Tampa. So thank you. Thank and you. Thanks for coming on. Thank yeah, you. happy to be here. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you guys for watching this episode. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like it. Check us out on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. Give us a comment. Give us some feedback. We want to know how we're doing. Thanks for watching. Bye, everybody.